I'm a northerner, born and bred. I was born in the northwest. I spent all of my adult life in the northeast, except for a couple of years in the deep south in Leicestershire. If you want to know the hideous truth, that's far enough south for anybody. But apart from that, it's been the north for me. And that's going to be the point of these programmes. They're going to be a celebration of the buildings, the towns and the villages, the built environment, you might say, if you were being a bit poncy, of northern England. And I've started here in this, in this little room because it is my study, though in this house it's still always called the little front bedroom, and because I wanted to have a bit of a moan. I've got hundreds of architecture books in here and I decided to look at them to see what they had to say about northern buildings. So I decided to have a romp through the indexes of a few of them. Do you know, it was a really irritating and depressing experience because in loads of them the, the north was hardly mentioned at all. It was as if we lived in an uninhabited wilderness. I mean, take this one, for example, which is a really famous book about the great houses of Britain. 39 of them, according to the index, one in the north. One! And even that one's in Yorkshire, which is, of course, a really big place, and even southerners have heard of that. And then there's churches. English parish churches. 193 photographs of churches, 10 in the north. It's as if we don't exist. And that's the point of this programme, to show that we do exist, to shout a bit, to show that there are things up here which are worthy of anybody's attention. When writers from elsewhere come to write about us, they tend to talk about two quite contradictory things. First of all, everybody agrees that it's wild up north. And of course, there's some truth in that. Where could you go further south and find splendid isolation like this? And yet the north is filled with it. Oozing emptiness, you could say, from the wildness of the Cheviots to this fantastic bit of wilderness high above Burnley in Lancashire. But writers from elsewhere aren't just interested in the wild landscape. They always seem to assume that because the countryside's a bit tough and wild, it means that the buildings are the same. And they often assume that we're wild too, the people who live here. One of my books that I was showing you back in my study starts with the words, rough are the winds and rough the moors, rough the castles and rough the miners. It's actually written about Northumberland, but it could just as well have been about the Lancashire landscapes. When you read books about buildings, it's as if we're living wild houses in a wild place, inhabited by strange, wild creatures called northerners. <laughs> it isn't true, of course. If writers don't say we're wild, they have a tendency to say that we're ghastly or grim or dark or satanic, depressing. Ooh, they say it's, it's really grim up north. It's a way of seeing us that's lasted for a long time. The Victorian novelist Mrs Gaskell was born in Chelsea but moved to Manchester when she was 23. And in her novel North and South, the heroine Margaret Hale, along with her mother, does exactly the same. She moves from a pretty southern village to a great northern city. It's a bit of a shock. Here's how she describes it in the novel. They were hurled over long, straight, hopeless streets of regularly built houses, all small and of brick. Here and there a great oblong, many-windowed factory stood up like a hen among her chickens, puffing out black smoke. Margaret's mother is utterly cheesed off at the prospect of moving to this bleak northern city. Oh, Margaret, are we to live here? asked Mrs Hale in blank dismay. Margaret's heart echoed the tone in which the question was put. Now, of course, Elizabeth Gaskell was writing a long time ago, in Victorian times. Nobody would still be talking about the North in those negative ways nowadays, would they? Phew, wouldn't they? They do it all of the time, man. 
Sometimes you get the impression that the national media only come up here to show factories closing in the rain. Recently, my local paper quoted a London critic who shall remain nameless, but who was obviously cross with Tyneside about something, because he said, Gateshead is a self-inflicted wound. Bomb it and then you'll change it. It's an awful place. Most of the North is awful. So there you are. Our buildings are either not there at all, or they're wild, or they're ghastly. How true is that picture? I intend to find out, for the truth must be told. And in order to tell it, I'm quite simply going to start this series by visiting four places in the north, four of my favourite buildings, and see whether together they give any sort of idea about what northern buildings are like. The first one, requires us to go to some of the North's most wild landscapes. Well, there's no shortage of wildness, and that's because in the past there were lots of things to be wild about. This is Hole Farm, H-O-L-E, at Bellingham in the Cheviot Hills in Northumberland. And this is the bustle at Hole Farm, so I could call it Hole Bustle. And as it's relatively unaltered and complete, I suppose I could go as far as calling it a Hole Hole Bustle. A bustle is a unique type of building that's only found near the Scottish border. And the thing that makes bustles unique is that they're intended to protect people and animals in the same building. People upstairs, animals downstairs. This is the ground floor buyer where the animals lived and it, it got most of its strength from these walls, four and a half to five feet thick. But overall, it's an incredible space, is it not? It's vaulted in stone. You would call this a tunnel vault because it's a simple rounded shape like the underside of a bridge or a tunnel. And there's a hole in the roof of the vault up there, what we might call a hole in the whole hole bustle, if we thought we could get away with it. But that's a ladder hole, so that the last person in could shut the buyer door and lock it and climb up to join the rest of his family upstairs. Now, it has been suggested, rather amusingly, since it's only 14 inches square, that I should demonstrate the use of that hole by attempting to get through it. Uh, maybe some time. So, this is where the people lived. I, I, I'm clearly not going to be able to get out of here, so I'll just be a moment. So this is where the people lived. It's not posh, is it? It's not sophisticated. What the people got was one room and one roughish fireplace, though at some later date there was an extra floor added, and at some later date also a couple of largish windows were added. But getting into here, if you weren't a weedy-shouldered wimp and couldn't make it through the floor, would have been a bit of a problem. You see, I came in through the door which was easy enough for me because I came up these steps. But the original inhabitants couldn't do that because the steps weren't there then. They were only added ages later, probably ooh, a couple of hundred years later. Originally, you had to climb up by ladder, which could be pulled up by the last person in, which is all very well, unless you were 93 and arthritic and there were 300 hairy Scotsmen charging across the field towards you. And that's the point of these bustles. This building is rough and wild because it was built at a time and in a place where life was hard and dangerous. By 1600, when this was built, there'd been war up here between the Scots and the English that had already gone on for 300 years. Violence was so common that the people from one valley attacked the people from the next. Nowhere was safe. No one could make money. So the result was these rough and ready buildings, which today are to be found all over the wild moors of the extreme north.
This is an exciting moment for me because I've been making television programs about buildings for a long time. But this is the very first time I've made one about a building in Lancashire. And for me first, I've chosen this one. Astley Hall at Chorley. It's Chorley's town museum and art gallery nowadays, but what a fantastic sight. Isn't that a wonderful place? There's more glass in the front of this building. What I mean by that is that there's more glass in comparison to the amount of wall than any other building I can think of. Any other old building, I mean. You'd have to come right up to date to the glass and steel office blocks of today before you'd find that much glass in a facade. But this was built in 16 something or other, in the 1650s I think, just a few years after the Basel in Northumberland. Hall Basel had two measly little windows set in massive walls. This has got, oh I don't know, loads. In fact it's got about two measly bits of wall between the windows. It is marvellous. In Northumberland I was going on about the roughness and the wildness and of course this is different isn't it? I mean at one level this is brilliant building but there is something excitingly OTT about it as well isn't there? You can imagine the owner saying we do not by halves up here son and another thing he must have said I want it just as good inside. The plaster work here is among the most remarkable that I've seen anywhere. It's so elaborate and it's so detailed that I can hardly imagine how it was done, let alone how it stayed up and in such good condition all of these years. One of my buildings books, those books I was on about at the beginning of the programme which I love so much but which always irritate me in their attitudes to the north, is very enthusiastic about this house. Indeed, it waxes lyrical about it and describes it as exceedingly rich and exceedingly skilfully done. Lots of nice positive comments like that. But at the same time, it's as if he can't resist having a bit of a dig at northerners as well. It's this one about North Lancashire by Nicholas Pevsner. Now Pevsner uses words like grim and ruthless and barbaric about Astley. He says it's barbaric in its very excesses, as if it was built like the rest of the North, by primitive and powerful trolls living in a dangerous and backward place. Well, just as a reminder to Mr P about what the North was capable of in the way of very civilised country houses, just look at these. <laughs> Favourite northern building number three is to be found in Liverpool, which is a terrific city. I'm not saying I'm new to it, but I'm new enough to still feel blown away whenever I come here. Its main glories are 19th century. By the 19th century, Liverpool had become a sort of super city, bigger and more powerful and much grander than many capital cities in other countries. And I'm sure we'll be back to look at some of those glories later in the series. But the building that I've chosen to start with doesn't really fit any of those descriptions. It's called Oriel Chambers and it was designed in 1864 by a man called Peter Ellis about whom I can tell you very little or indeed anything at all because I don't know anything about him except that he designed this and one other building which I'm going to show you in a moment. The point about this building is that it's unbelievably ahead of its time. Victorian buildings are usually fancy and built very obviously of some suitably solid material like stone. But in this case, it's glass that dominates. Just like at Astley Hall, it's glass that makes it so advanced. The front is almost pure glass, separated by just the most slender stone columns. It's almost impossible to believe that that wall was designed in mid-Victorian times. But there's more. The bones, the real structure of this building, is revealed inside. The whole building is really an iron frame. It's these iron beams that support the whole weight of the building, so that the glass and the stone that you can see from the outside is no more than a thin skin. This is the way that most modern offices are built, 
but in 1864 it was way, way ahead of its time. But the other wonderful thing here is that the revolutionary new structure has also changed the whole atmosphere of the rooms inside. When you think of Victorian offices, you can't help thinking about something that Dickens might have described. High stools and candles and dusty old clerks pouring over dusty old ledgers. But this is nothing like that. This use of iron and glass was the future. This is what offices were going to become. They hated it at the time. They called it an abortion and moaned about its protruding plate glass bubbles which is presumably why Mr Ellis only got to build two buildings, as far as we know. This is his other one, 16 Cook Street, which was built a couple of years later and which is at least as extreme. In fact, at the back it seems even more so. This blows me away. You could be excused for thinking that this staircase was a modern building. It's almost pure glass. So together, these two buildings in Liverpool by an almost unknown northern architect make a point about northern building as a whole which my books often seem to neglect. That often we lead the way. That often northerners have been so inventive that they have revolutionised the direction that buildings have gone. Which brings me to my fourth and final favourite building for this week. Prepare yourself for a bit of a change from this little side street. There is no building greater than Durham Cathedral. A poll of world architects recently voted it the greatest building in the world and though I haven't visited all of the others so I can't comment on them, I want to stress that in talking about Durham Cathedral we are talking about a building which is seriously good. The architect was seriously good too. I wish I could tell you his name, but I don't know it. I know the name of his masters, of the bishops that he worked for, but not his. But whatever he was called, he was a genius who helped transform the history of architecture. These are rib vaults, and Durham was the first building in Europe to use them. The pointed arches that divide the nave into sections are among the very earliest pointed arches in the world and that too was an innovation that was to be hugely important in the history of architecture. So the unknown architect was a brilliant engineer and inventor but he was also a brilliant designer. Durham is a work of genius inside, transforming the usually solid and weighty Norman style into something that soars. It's amazing how it's done. The piers of the nave, for example, are massive. Their circumference is almost the same as their height. They're about 24 feet round and 27 feet high, which ought to make them look solid and as dumpy as anything. Imagine what you would look like if you were almost the same circumference around the waist as you were at all. Hmm? I'm five foot eight inches tall, for example. Imagine what I would look like if I was 60 inches around the waist. Roly-poly, you would say. Short and dumpy. But the piers at Durham are nothing like that. This is partly because the line of the piers continues to soar upwards into the beautiful stone vaults. But the decoration of the piers also helps to take away the dumpiness. They've got extraordinary incised carvings on them, zigzags and ribs and lozenges and spirals which are deep and bold and energetic, creating an image of life rather than solidity. They look absolutely wonderful. Durham looks wonderful from outside too, partly because of its three lofty towers and the beauty of its stone, but mainly because of its extraordinary situation. It's built on a deep meander of the River Weir, and by some miracle or accident, the steep banks of the river which almost surround it have never been built on and have been left covered with trees, so that almost wherever you look from, the church floats above the treetops and the river much as it must have done 900 years ago when it was first built. 
So there you are, a few relatively random northern buildings. What do they say about us? That we're a bit wild, touch OTT at times, that far from being the back of beyond, we can be revolutionary and leaders of fashion, and that we're capable of creating the very best that there is. That's not bad for a start.